we're just going to talk a little bit about what we do with Black Feast and, um, and run through some images from previous events and kind of what our mission and what our story is. I'm Saul Matu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Monica, in case you need another reminder. <laughs> so this is from, um, from our mission, but Black Feast is a creation of Black narrative and an offering to Black lineage. Black Feast is a culinary event that celebrates Black artists and writers through food. This meal is created as a celebration, a dance, and an offering. This meal is created for you. And that is the, you know, that is our first kind of copy, our first line for Black Feast. And that originated you know, that's really the origins of this story and the origins of the whole concept is about when we assume who our audience is, that oftentimes as Black people, we feel excluded from that. And so the things that we read, the copy, the way that things are marketed towards like us as the general us or the general you often and most times doesn't include Black people. So from the very start, the idea for me was to really create something that centers a Black audience and where a Black audience is really assumed. And so when we say that you, the you is assumed to be Black. And so just the power of that language, that power of really naming who this is for um, is, you know, the really, the foundation of Black Feast and where it all started. And the theme, as was noted for today's talk, is promise. And promise can be seen as two things. It can be seen as a pledge to do or bring about something, or it can be to give good grounds for expecting. And it comes from Latin promiter, which means to send forth and to let go and to foretell. And so throughout this, we're going to be thinking about how Black Feast can be seen as a promise, to be seen as something that we can be pledging towards as an action, but also as a space of possibility. So we'll just be reflecting back to that theme throughout this work, but we're just curious how you can be thinking of your creative practice as well as a space of possibility and as a promise towards the values that you want to see in the world. How did Black Feast begin? <laughs> um, so this is a little bit about our origin story. This photo I love because it's like, Every, every event and kind of going through this archive has been so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Annika put together this amazing, you know, this amazing presentation. And it, we were both just like, oh, look at us, <laughs> look at this stuff that we did. <laughs> and, and so it's been, you know, at this point, it's been over three years. And this was one of our very first dinners. Uh, this one, I believe, was for Nina Simone's album, Nuff Said. And so at the very beginning of Black Feast, kind of, uh, to be honest, there was a lot of fear around creating this event for me. And, you know, were people going to show up? Um, just, you know, it felt really um, nerve wracking. And so the first dinner was on Audre Lorde's Sister Outsider. And I chose four chapters and created four courses um, that went along with that, uh, with those chapters. And so this meal was Nina Simone's album, Nuff Said. My friend Brandon, who's an incredible designer based here in Brooklyn, came out and these orchids on the table, I was like, the vision is orchids, we must have orchids. <laughs> and we didn't have a ton of funding at the time because a big part of Black Feast is about accessibility and financial accessibility. And so we have a sliding scale ticket that's for Black people, uh, Indigenous people of color. And so really it's like, folks can be paying, Black folks can be paying $5, $0 to come to like this four course dinner. So at the very beginning, our funding was low. I just wanted to see if I could make this happen. 
So we got a table full of orchids. Brandon and I went and got like 20 orchids and then we returned them all to Fred Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> we love that 30 day return policy. So, you know, at the very beginning, the humble beginnings and um, we were doing these pop-up dinners uh, sold out time and time again. We were doing about 45 people, uh, four courses. And that's me solo in that kitchen. <laughs> Which I was gonna hop in and say, like, you're saying we <laughs> like Black Bees began just from this beautiful one's creation. Like solely created the concept, like was solely cooking these beautiful <laughs> dinners and then like weaving them into these artists' work, like by yourself. Mm. Like so. <laughs> As he's saying, like, we, like, I'm like, <laughs> I didn't come into the picture until a few years later <laughs> when you were doing this by yourself. Like, and I don't know if any of y'all are in like the culinary game or just the events game, like, but like hosting one thing by yourself is kind of impossible. I don't really know <laughs> how you're still with us, but yes so I'm just like give you your flowers <laughs> here like, no. but yes and this was uh this was one of the first this was actually the first dinner and I was when Anika says I was doing it solo I was really creating graphics on my scanner this is the graphic that I created on my scanner for our first zine um, and so this was kind of like the first, you know, the first graphic, the first images that we were using to show Black Beast. And this was from the dinner, uh, Sister Outsider. Mm -hmm. This is also one of our first meals. I had a dear friend, Ludmila Zotova, come in and do a shoot with us for Life and Time magazine, which was kind of like our first big piece of press and felt mm -hmm. like, really um i think i was nervous to do that interview because of just the fear around like doing something like this and doing something that is really about centering a black audience and just being a bit fearful about negative feedback and like absolutely there was there was negative feedback like facebook some comment like what if there was a dinner that only centered white people? And I'm like, that's literally all dinner experiences and everywhere. Yeah, so. that's, that's um, <laughs> and so I think I was fearful about, about that, um, about negative feedback, but then I also really believe in it. And so there's this part of when you're doing something that is near and dear to your heart, that it's like what is what happens when I put this out into the world and what happens if people reject it and the thing is if it's near and dear to your heart then you really believe in that and if you really believe in it so what if people reject it um because there are going to be so many people who are like find it deeply healing deeply inspiring find it um to be so absolutely necessary and if you believe it to be necessary too and you believe it to be essential then there's a place for it yes i feel like that <laughs> that combo speaks to like how i found black bees so i'm i'm from east palo alto california in the suburbs of sacramento california and then i lived in portland with my family for 12 years, they're still based there. But after I graduated from college out in Oberlin, Ohio, I came back and I was coming back at my school, even though it was a predominantly white institution, there was a really strong queer and black community. And I went from that back to Portland, <laughs> which does not have that at all. And it was very hard. And I found Saul Mati's work through Facebook events. And I just saw this incredible person hosting these experiences with artists that I love. And I was like, oh my God, um, I need to figure out how to meet this person. <laughs> and then we then we met at a Doug House show. Yeah. You don't know Deep Underground um, has done incredible work with black and brown artists. But 
I came on, I think just solely wanting to help with like anything with like setting up tables or like anything at all. And then I kind of wormed my way. You didn't worm your way. They did not worm their way. I, uh, we met at this Doug show and Annika was performing. Annika is, if you don't know, then you gotta know. Uh, Annika is an incredible poet and, uh, you know, I curse him because he makes me cry like every time he performs. Uh, but they performed their poetry at this, you know, at this house show. And they said, hey, I'm just like, I've come back to Portland. So, you know, I'm, you know, an introvert. So if you're an extrovert looking to adopt an introverted friend, please hit me up. And I like beelined <laughs> towards them afterward. And I was like, I am here. Hello, it's me. I'm your friend. Let's do this. And that's how we met. And we, you know, I wanted to feature Annika at Black Feast. And so Annika was a featured artist. And that like really started this whole um, kind of new iteration of Black Feast where we were working with you know, emerging artists and we we're working with artists because before then we were working with artists whose work was, you know, kind of in like a historical context, like they were no longer living. And so we were kind of revisiting these really important works. And that changed a lot uh, by working with artists who are currently making work and who could be there at the dinner and kind of be celebrated in their time in this way. And that became such an essential part of it because it really made it this full circle event. So it's something that's supporting the diners, you know, it's supporting our Black community, it's supporting our artists who come in and get to be celebrated in this way. And it's also supporting us mm -hmm. by, you know, we get to do something that is deep, that feeds and nourishes us deeply. Exactly. What is the promise of Black Feast? I feel like you just named it. I mean, honestly. Yes. <laughs> you did just name the promise. That's of it. really what it's about. It's about celebrating our community. And it is about creating, yeah, creating these spaces of, you know, I think Annika and I are both storytellers. And so as artists, as you know, just facilitators in the world like we believe in the power of storytelling and so so much about storytelling so much about like fiction and fantasy is about imagining imagining what is possible and what you know what is the potential of these future spaces and so a lot of that is really about disregarding the things that have um, the frameworks that do not serve us whatsoever and deciding that we want to create something new we want to create something that is like fantastical and something that is beautiful and doesn't necessarily have to follow this rubric of you know what an a sit down dinner needs to be what an event needs to be how you need to make money how you need to support your community and so it's constantly shifting and morphing based on the needs of the people that we center and the, the needs of Black people. This is a dinner that we did uh, at Hell's Half Acre Farm, which if you're in Portland, hopefully you know this farm. They are actually now doing, they're a floral farm, but they were, all of this produce we had on the table had just been like harvested hours before, like fresh raspberries, like the most amazing variety of greens. And Yawa was performing at the Swan Yawa Avioto. So this was such an amazing dinner in Portland, it just like so, so vibrant, so beautiful, packed. <laughs> really, <laughs> we really packed people in there. We really we're did. running out of table room by the end. Um, yeah, this was Black Feast Plant It. So the, the meal was named around uh, Yawa's EP and there were four different courses based on their songs. And it was really about like abundance and growth and freshness and yeah. Yes. I feel like that goes into like the, like just the, 
what you were saying before about also Black Feast being this like fantastical space because like a lot of the time people are like, oh, food. <laughs> like they're like, they're <laughs> like, oh, like this is like something that should be in like food and wine or like, well, not Bon Appetit because we don't talk about Bon Appetit anymore. <laughs> but like Black Feast is like a space where it's like, this is an arts space. Like this is something where like, it should be in like the Guggenheim where it, should, like, <laughs> where it should be in like the studio museum of Harlem, like, et cetera. And so like, if you look at the artists that we've worked with and like Salmont, you noted, he takes these artists work and creates these pieces because they are courses, but they're also like pieces of art, like at the same time. and puts them into the world. And we've worked with such like amazing artists. We've worked with Jamila Woods. That was a dope dinner. It was a beautiful dinner. That and was for, um, what's the festival's name? As soon as you, pit, mm, nope, not Pitchfork. <laughs> that, That's a music that magazine. That one festival in Portland, oh my God. Was well, it's a great festival. Yep. You know the one, <laughs> you all know the one. <laughs> <laughs> it'll come to me later mm -hmm. um that was great it was really fun um j dodd we did that one at the at the red in portland mm -hmm. and which was such an incredible space mm -hmm. and i really i appreciate you emphasizing like the meals because i definitely tend to you know first and foremost i'm a chef and also my background is in multimedia art so I studied film and photo and it makes it so that, you know, I think Annika and I both being kind of like multidisciplinary artists, we want to do all the jobs. And so we really love every aspect of this, like the menu planning, like the food part is really like my domain. It's like the oh, thing yeah. that I get to have to myself because we're constantly like switching jobs and, um, and so this is the part that I really love because it's the most sort of, to me, it's like the most meditative part of everything. It's like listening to an album or like reading a poem again and again and thinking about like, what are the, like, what am I visualizing? What is the kind of social, historical, racial context for this? You know, what um, yeah, what story is being told and how does that translate into palette? How does that translate into taste and texture? And how is that going to come together as a story on the plate? How is that going to come together as a story as people experience those tastes? And so that process is really, you know, it's vague and it's strange and it, it feels like this like spiritual act of engaging with artists work and then kind of translating that and that transmutation into this, you know, into this form of a sit down dinner. Mm -hmm. And it comes through in all of these ways because we work with all types of artists. Like Jay is an incredible, now Portland based poet. Um, Lucasa Bronfram Verismo is a visual artist. And so these are some of their pieces yeah. and then they're translated into these pieces and also i think we forgot to note that everything you make is gluten-free and vegan and made without cane sugar as well we so. love a dietary restriction <laughs> make these as accessible for as many folks as possible erica demon is an incredible um bay area based artist um and you took her pieces mm -hmm. um in this case, it was this portrait series that she did and each one of the portraits was named after the person. And then you took each, you took four pieces and then made a piece based off of that. Yeah, that was our first, uh, that was our first dinner in Berkeley, California. And which is now where I am based uh, primarily at the time for an artist residency. Um, and if you go back to Lucasa's, uh, Lucasa's was the first uh, dinner that we did during the pandemic as we were trying to figure out, you know, how all of this would 
translate, you know, into, you know, the big part of it is this community space and also looking around and seeing all these other black folks and all these other brown folks at the table and just seeing like how your community is showing up together. And so how does that change when you can't all gather together in this space? And so we had this pickup window and we were doing to go orders and you can see in the background, uh, Lucas's prints some of her prints are there and so she was there as well and just getting to see people through this window we built this little counter takeout counter and i built an awning that we covered with flowers and uh it ended up being just like such a beautiful night uh to you know just to be able to celebrate that and and it is there is something that is missed you know when you don't get to see everyone enjoying the meal you kind of like send them off with these packages of love. But it, you know, as we are adapting and as we're like trying to do something to fulfill these needs. And this was also the first dinner that we made completely free for black people. We didn't even offer the sliding scale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're just like, you know what? We just gotta make something free right now. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a good transition to like where we're at now. So I'm gonna like move, just move through some of these other artists that we've worked with, but yeah, well. <laughs> which was an incredible dinner called Plant It. We've worked with Madison McFerrin, who's an incredible singer. And we had a dinner. That was in New York. In New York. That was really good. Um, that was just breathtaking. Um, a future meal that we're gonna be having in March is with Yatunde, who's an incredible visual based artist. And so over time, now with like the shift of pandemic, etc. But it also like it feels like if because this is an in person event, we often get the question like, how has this shifted with the pandemic, it seems like the ways that black Feast has shifted is also just like, as our growth in general from being like, an in person event to this larger creative ecosystem, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about more. But Altar of Black Life was Saw Matsu's conception. Um, if you want to talk about it, it's yeah. so beautiful. This was during, so I'm currently an artist in residence at 2727 California Street, which is a, you know, arts access and education uh, building space organization in Berkeley. And so part of, you know, during the height of protests over the summer, I wanted to do something to just like honor our black, black loved ones in our lives. And so I built this altar and it's called an altar to black life. And so people came and brought flowers and photos. I, they sent in photos and I printed out the photos and framed them and put them on the altar. And so it was really about a celebration for, you know, the people in our lives who we have lost and the people in our lives who we just love and we don't get to be near right now because, you know, because of the pandemic. And so it was just so beautiful. And also I don't always like think of myself, like my own role in all of this. And so, you know, the first person who sent in their photos, I was like already like in tears. I was like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. <laughs> so I think that that's, that's also it's like, oh yeah, we're just gonna get these photos and build an altar. And then as I'm doing it, it became like something, you know, the amount of care that goes into it every day of like cleaning the altar and lighting candles and, you know, getting rid of the dead flowers and building it up every day, it became like such a, like such a deeply impactful uh, project because it was up for, I think a couple months and it actually consumed a lot of my, a lot of my time, a lot of my day to just keep building it and watching it grow. Mm -hmm. And love letters to black folks. So that is, you know, kind of the most recent iteration of Black Feast. And 
that was really, you know, at that same time that the altar was being built. Um, you know, Annika was here and I was in California. And so just trying to figure out a way that we could offer something more often mm -hmm. and a way that we could collaborate, you know, from our two ends of the country. And so, you know, just to make a Black Feast event happen, there's a lot of coordinating with the artists, with the space, just like developing four course menu, ingredients, everything like that. So we started Love Letters. So Annika wrote Love Letters to Black folks. And then I created the, this is an example of the letter. Um, this is a risograph. Um, and so, then I created the meals and people would come and pick them up. We got, we would get about 100 to over 200 reservations each week. We did it for 10 weeks straight. It was a lot. And <laughs> we started getting donations, you know, calling for donations for flowers. And so by the end of it, we were providing flowers, care packages, desserts, love letters. And uh, it was such a beautiful event. And so now we're doing it less often because we have to live our lives in other ways too at the moment. And, um, but our next one will be on Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. In Berkeley. Love, yeah, in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like when love letters came about, that was at some of the beginning of the uprisings like you noted <laughs> and Salmasu and I were both like separately like how do I support like what's happening right now because all of us have a role in supporting liberation work and we were just thinking of our own role in that and something that we were really like thinking about which I think is just in our personal ideals and also just as artists is we're often thinking about care um we're often thinking about how care can work in, in spaces for ourselves, for our relationships, um, how we can be supporting each other's capacity to hold joy, to have pleasure. And so this was a really big part of that in like, in a time where I feel like often I'm being accosted by images of black death by people that do not hold the meaning or the history of that very intentionally. So with that, it really meant something to like intentionally hold a space that was about joy and pleasure and care and what that means. And so like, these are some of the images from Love Letters to Black Folks. And we found um, all of these gorgeous black queer couples across time mm -hmm. that have always existed like that have always been here um and you know we're both gay as fuck so we <laughs> were like you know like we're gonna be centering like this as well but it really was like this moment of those are like care packages mm -hmm. these were care packages with like goods donated from so many spots and we had so many local places in Portland donate, which was incredible. Um, and this is Jasmine, who's amazing, who is helping package everything. Been helping us since day one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it really was just this moment of just like being like, and you say this all the time, you're just like, you, you deserve care without having to give anything. Because I feel like that's so much of like a very western understanding of care is that you have to do something to deserve getting it or you have to do something like yeah you just have to do something to deserve right. it and it's like well what makes you deserving of care is that you're here and that i want to be in relationship with you intentionally so that was a really big moment i think yes, look at us <laughs> being nuts and <laughs> Packaging all of these things. Yeah, this was a strawberry shortcake with fig leaf cream. That was a that was a great time. It, it was, was so cool. astounding. <laughs> and I feel like all we have left are like these larger questions about like mm -hmm. what Black Feast is. But this was something that we were talking about, which is like, how does Black Feast teach you? to articulate joy. And I think like that's one of 
that's one of the promises like of this space is like I think a lot about how like radical is just like posted everywhere now and like it's just used as a hashtag and people don't really think about like how is this radical because radical is changing it's pushing up against the norm and so for us it's radical to be able to really intentionally think about joy and think about taking up space on our own grounds, on our own table. Cause I think that's like the really big thing is that like we're striving to become this entire ecosystem that stands on its own, that isn't trying to like get into these like <laughs> other institutions that don't really care about us. And so in that way, like in this space that's so rooted in care, like there's something radical about that and like really celebrating these artists work and celebrating the people that come in the economic model that we strive towards because we really something that we've done before and that we do now is like having white people pay for the meals for black folks to come in and really thinking about that as an act of care because sometimes people think about that in terms of like I don't know they feel a type of way about it but it's like well can you see this as support like can you see this as part of a larger picture yeah and to let go of ideas of neutrality right like that no space is neutral no organization is neutral you know what like, there is this inherent bias in in all aspects of of life basically and so for us to really confront that and you know and see like the way that I think about things is you know sometimes to like reroute my brain or sometimes to like like try and kind of decondition or like let go of this like uh conditioning around like the hustle around the grind you know around productivity <clears throat> for me that's really really difficult and so even though i'm doing this work and i want to give care to other people when it comes to like giving that to myself it's like impossible like i'm not eating when i'm like doing this stuff i'm not like feeding myself i'm not sleeping we're like you know a lot of times it's like I'm really grinding to make this stuff happen. And so part of what we try and do for each other is like, Annika will bring me food. Annika <laughs> will be like, have you slept? Annika will be like, maybe this thing can go. Maybe we don't need to do this stuff. And so part of that is like how we're showing up for each other and like in this like unconditional love and unconditional care and really trying to make that the foundation of what we do and reminding ourselves that like, we don't have to show up for people 24 seven. It's okay to take your mental health time. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be like, I'm suffering and I also wanna do this thing. And I also, as soon as this event is over, I need to go and crash and not look at my phone yeah. for like three days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> which I feel like is the promise that Black Feast is stretching towards. It's like, how do we become a sustainable, which means like slow and steady, which really is the direct act against everything we know of how to run these types of projects, <laughs> like, but really how to sustainably be a system that sustains care, mm -hmm. like, and sustains joy and not even sustains, celebrates, and to be a space that promises um, commitment and intention towards Black artistry. And that's the promise within Black Feast is to really be its own table to supporting Black artistry as well. And I think that's the promise of this is made for you. Like, I feel like that is like one of the most yeah. important promise of the entire space is really to be centering the people that we love and we care about and to be centering Black people and to be the people that are doing that centering like, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, you know, for us, like Black Feast will probably morph and change into many different things. You know, during the pandemic, we don't get to do as much like food, sit down dinners as we, as we were able to, um, but, you know, something 
that we can do is find other ways to, you know, celebrate artists, find other ways to provide care, whether that's like mailing packages or doing pickup windows. And so we're constantly in conversation with how we can morph and shape and evolve based on the needs of our community. And, you know, it's not easy to kind of like throw out all of the rubrics and all of the everything that we've learned and try to really um, interrogate those ideas around like, why, do, why does something need to be this way? Is it actually the most beneficial when it looks like this? Is, like, is a capitalist structure actually benefiting anyone? And, um, and so it's not a, so yeah, we're trying to move slow and steady and take care of each other, take care of ourselves. Uh, and, and that's kind of our commitment, our dedication is to keep doing this work for the rest of our lives in some way, shape or form. Exactly. And I think that's, that's the next step of what we are stretching towards also is to have a physical space. We're going to be launching fundraising soon so that we can have our own space um, in the Bay Area and my family's from East Palo Alto and Oakland and got pushed out of those areas. So it's also about reclaiming space that has been ours um, to build out a whole new space for the Black Feast world. And yeah, yeah. that's our story. That's our story. <laughs>